The thing in the thing. Is the chimney a shoot of air where gray smoke clots and rises? Or is the chimney the bricks, the mason's careful art? Is the car a box of metal, a web of gauges and fuses, or the feeling of speed gathering under your right foot? The tree waves its branches and becomes, thanks to wind, more tree. The clouds lend more meaning to the sky. Water maintains its fluidity even while held in the confines of a glass. A glass of water is a shape, not a nature. The true nature of a thing, its essence, is something pure and focused like a stone holding its hardness. A telephone holds its ring as pure potentiality. Then it does ring, and it's Gwen, and she's telling me a story about her sister in Knoxville or explaining the common root of a word in Italian and a word in Hebrew. Not knowing the name of a thing changes nothing, but when I can, I like to know. The sky holds nothing back. Every time the barometer drops, it makes some big confession. That's poet Kim Roberts reading The Thing in the Thing. It's from her recent collection, The Scientific Method. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. We close out National Poetry Month with one of Washington, D.C.'s literary lights, Kim Roberts. Kim has published five books of poetry. She's founding editor of Beltway Poetry Quarterly, and co-founding editor of Delaware Poetry Review. And she's also a literary historian, and she's a literary historian whose research focuses on writers who've lived in the district. Kim is an observational poet rather than a confessional one, informed by a lively curiosity and a distinctive poetic voice. Her most recent collection is The Scientific Method. In The Scientific Method, Kim combines poetry about Thomas Alva Edison, Ming, the oldest living clam, the pineapple, and the American herring gull. Her work is both thought-provoking and refreshing. Her subjects, clearly unusual. How many poets, after all, write about science? I've always been curious about science, but uh, I always assumed that I couldn't do it. In my household, the skills were divided, and my brother got math and science, and I got English and social studies. But as it turns out, you don't need to have training as a scientist to write about what I would consider popular science, public science. It just takes curiosity and reading. And I think, actually, the fact that I'm not a specialist has made it possible for me to translate science for a a non-specialist audience. At least I hope so. That's part of the, uh, the goal. How did this book, The Scientific Method, how did it come to be? Oh, I suppose the way all my books come to be There's not any real plan to begin with. I just start writing things that fascinate me. And one poem grows from the next. And at some point, I think, oh, (laughs) these might all go together in a manuscript. And did you start doing research about science when you realized you could have a collection of poems that looked at science from various angles? No, I'd just been sort of heading in that direction for a while. And So your reading was taking you there. Yes, that's right. I wasn't really thinking in terms of, oh, let you know, let's let's set up a theme for a book. It just happened more of its own accord. Organically, as we say. Oh, there you go. A good scientific (laughs) word. Exactly. (laughs) Recently, you spent some time at a field station in Minnesota, correct? Yes. Last summer, I was lucky enough to get a grant to be a writer-in-residence at a scientific field station. The, the grant was sponsored by the Science Museum of Minnesota. It was terrific. The field station was specifically looking at bodies of water. It's the St. Croix River uh, research station is on. So I know that river. You know that river. <gasps> And so the scientists just welcomed me with open arms. They were happy to show me how instruments in their lab worked, but they were also happy for me to to take me out um, with them to do water sampling. I spent one whole day 
learning about harmful algal blooms in lakes in the northern Midwest. It was fascinating. It was terrific to see someone else's obsession at work. Was this a one-off, or do they have an ongoing program? They've had other artists in residence they there. Have, so, so that's something they do. So I, yes, it's something they do regularly. There are different artists who are in residence there every summer. Are the scientists expected to interact with the artists or vice versa? No, not particularly. I loved being among scientists. But, you know, it is true that some of the artists who come really are there just to do their own work. They're not interested in interacting that much. And I made it clear right from the start that I wanted to look through their microscopes. I wanted to learn about what their projects were. I wanted to really take full advantage of being there. What's your earliest experience with poetry? How did you get into the poetry game? Mm. Wow, that's really interesting. You know, Strangely enough, I was writing poems as a very young child. I was interested in the, the musicality of language from, from really early on. Poetry has been a part of my life from the time I was just a little girl. Did your parents read poems to you? Did they have an interest in, in literature and poetry? No, not particularly. They certainly have had an interest in the arts and took me regularly to museums and performances. My father was a big opera buff. So the arts were, were well represented in the household. When did you know it was something that you really wanted to do? I guess I would say in college. You know, <laughs> In college, you have to declare yourself at some point. You have to pick a major. And I ended up uh, at a, a college where you could actually major in creative writing. There aren't a lot of places where you can get a, a Bachelor of Fine Arts in, in creative writing. But I went to Emerson College in Boston. And um, I started taking classes in the creative writing department, quite frankly, to boost my grade point average because I assumed I would do well. You know, I've always liked writing. But then once I was in those classes, you know, I got sucked in. And then the longer I, I was in college, the more passionate I started to get about creative writing. I was writing both fiction and poetry. Well, that leads exactly to my next question. Why poetry? What was it about poetry that spoke to you? I started as a fiction writer, but of all of the various components of fiction, you know, if you break it down, you have characterization and setting and dialogue and what symbolism and plot. I am least interested in plot. You have to include some plot. The readers <laughs> demand it, but of really, which I would be one. <laughs> but it really um, is is the thing that that interests me least, and so. It became clear that that was going to be the weakness in any prose writing that I did. So it was with great relief that I switched over to poetry. How did they react when you made it clear you were going to be a poet? Oh, <laughs> my parents were always very against this idea. <laughs> uh, this was a, a totally alien idea to them, and um, I think it scared them quite a lot. I'd love to have you read a poem, and I'd like you to read the title poem, The Scientific Method. Okay. So this is a poem that was inspired by visiting the Thomas Alva Edison Laboratory Complex in New Jersey. It's a national historic site now, and what makes that place so incredibly marvelous is that they have not just the buildings, but also all of the things inside the buildings have been preserved. So the curators have thousands and thousands of items. They have all of the items in the metallurgical lab. They've got all of the old m recording machinery in the music recording studio. It's amazing. And even the storerooms, they have some of the original raw materials that were, were there. So this is a poem in two parts, and it's really about the two different ways that, that science happens in increments or in large intuitive leaps. The first part is the chemistry laboratory, test tubes and retorts, powders in stoppered bottles, some bright blue. Chemistry proceeds in increments. We try this, fail, try that. 
from stoppered bottles, some bright blue, powder of nickel citrate, try this, wrong amount, try that, the pure color of a robin's egg. Powder of nickel citrate waits to reveal its secrets. The colors, burnt orange, robin's egg, bloom in the high pressure distill. To reveal a thing's secrets, patience and precision are required. To bloom in a high pressure distill demands just the smallest change. Patience and repetition are required. Watch your test tubes and retorts, your powders, for just the smallest change, proof of how chemistry proceeds in increments. Part two is the stockroom. The new supplies have just arrived. Rhinoceros horn and elephant hide, cataloged and shelved, wait mutely for some mucker to decide that their covalent dipeptide might serve some unaccustomed duty. When blizzards locked two men inside, Fessenden and Ailes survived three days on items picked astutely from the new supplies. Wayward innovation thrives as muckers wander down the aisles buggered by the absolutely varied proofs of worldly beauty fresh applications might devise. Eccentric fancy is their guide through the new supplies. Kim Roberts reading The Scientific Method. Patience and repetition and patience and persistence. It also applies to poetry now. Absolutely, absolutely. These methods that scientists <laughs> use are the methods that anyone in any creative field uses. Little tiny increments, little edits, and then big leaps. Both impossible to predict. You're in college, you want to write poetry, and there are many people who want to do that, but you actually do and have published five books. <laughs> Uh, it took a while, but no, yes. <laughs> I understand that. But so what's the trajectory from wanting to do that in college and then actually being able to make a life where you do do it? I also went to graduate school, so I have a, a matched set of degrees, a BFA and a MFA, both in creative writing. So it was in graduate school where I learned some of the skills that you need to be professional about this. And then since graduate school, I've done a lot of work as an arts administrator. And the skills that you use for organizations also work well to your own personal benefit. So I know how to get myself grants and fellowships and uh, how to apply for things, how to present myself, how to make proposals for books. Right. It's the part two. There's the writing of the poetry, but then there's the finding the funding for the writing of the poetry, and then there's the promoting the poetry that you write. Right, right. And and there are many people who are really fine writers who just can't do the other side, yeah. uh, what I call po-biz. So their work suffers for that. Um, it, it's unfortunate that we, we are expected now to do it all. There are no longer editors in the publishing business who work with you to refine your work. They want a finished book. There are no longer publicists who, who are going to set up readings for you. You know, poets, you pretty much have to do it for yourself. The scientific method is divided into three parts. Tell me how you organize the book. Well, the themes sort of run in and out throughout, but I have most of the more sciencey poems in the first section. And the second section has a lot of poems about Judaism and Jewish identity. And the third section has a lot of poems about place. And the place specifically is Washington, D.C., where I live. That makes it sound like it's very neatly divided. The themes sort of flow in and out. But in, in general, there are three major themes in the book. I'd like you to read something from the second section, the section that deals a lot with Judaism and your parents and grandparents as well. And poem I have starred is A Boy Named Schmutz. Oh. <laughs> okay, so this is a poem that really is based on a real experience from my father's childhood. And 
the reason I wrote it is because my father never spoke about his childhood. He never spoke about anything personal at all. So the fact that I happen to know one story is rather remarkable. I'm not quite sure why I know this story or how it came about that, that he told this. He was too taciturn. He just didn't speak about himself. So schmutz is, of course, a Yiddish word meaning dirt. A boy named Schmutz. His mother dressed him up so fine, spent all her cash on sailor suits, wool knickers with the sewn-in pleats, and floppy, grosgrain ribbon ties. The Coney Island crowd of boys liked him, though, his dirty jokes, his pitching arm, also the way he let his mother dress him up then watched her face go purple-red, screaming down the tenement walls to all the ragged neighbor boys who called him out to stickball games. His name is Irving, she would shout to my father and his gang below. It's Irving, you dirty indigents, you impecunious gutter rats. No one screamed as gloriously. How dare you beggars call him schmutz? Good reading. It's a very visual poem. How do poems start for you? What gets you at your desk in writing? Poems start for me with something outside myself. Poems always start by something I'm reading, something that I'm looking at, a historic site that I go to, uh, a painting that I'm looking at. They start with something that I read or experience that just clicks If I can't stop thinking about it, that's the sign. Now, what's your writing routine? Do you try to write every day? Oh, I wish I was more disciplined like that. I get away with not being disciplined because I happen to be fairly prolific. So, no, I don't write every day, but I do write a lot. I guess I would say my routine is to write a lot and hope that a small proportion of that will rise to the surface and be what I call a keeper. How do you decide? Oh, you sort of know with what feels right. You don't know right away, of course. You you write something and you think, I'm a genius. Look at what I've just done. And then you let it sit for a while. And then you realize, actually, I'm an idiot. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, you know, much of what I write is not actually usable, but it's still, that's part of the process. That's an important part for me is um, to write a lot of crappy poems and from that, take that small percentage that I want to keep working on. I do quite a lot of editing and sometimes the editing process will last a year or more before I move forward um, with doing something public with a poem. But I do have a a writer's group that I share works in progress with, and we meet once a month, and they're invaluable. I assume during the editing process, that's also another place where you decide what's a keeper and what's not. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The editing process can be daunting for a lot of people. Editing (laughs) is, it's a hard skill. It's, um... I hope that I have become better at I think I have become better at it. When I was a younger writer, I would often edit a poem to death. You could feel the, the, the spark in it just sort of seeping away uh, as, as you edited. So it, it's not perfection that you're looking for in the, the editing process. It's more uh, refining. I'd love to hear another poem. How about the international fruit of welcome? <laughs> Another poem from section two. (laughs) Sure. The International Fruit of Welcome. A pineapple is the perfect gift to bring to a blind date. A pineapple is like a blind date, spiky and armored at first, with a hope of sweetness inside. A pineapple is the perfect housewarming gift. You don't have to wrap it. It doesn't spill inside your car. It comes in its own house. A pineapple is the perfect birthday gift. You might prefer a coconut, that planet molten at the core, but the pineapple has a better hairdo, better wardrobe. It never goes out of style. Think of all those historic houses with pineapple bolsters, pineapple finials, pineapples carved above lintels. Such a sophisticated fruit. Every sailor wants one. 
Okay. What inspired that poem, which I find charming? (laughs) It really is true that if you go to historic sites, which I happen to adore, especially uh, historic sites that are in seafaring towns, historically seafaring towns, you will see pineapples everywhere. They were a colonial sign of hospitality. They were very hard to come by. And if you served a pineapple to your guests, that was the ultimate gesture of hospitality. So you will see, oh, all over Boston, all over a lot of these New England seaside towns that had that kind of uh, history of trade and a whaling industry, you just, you see pineapples everywhere. They actually are carved into the architecture. So I was thinking about that, and I actually did watch a video of a a friend's sister. She had set up a series of blind dates and then decided to video them. I know, it was was an art project. At any rate, one of the, the people who showed up and had agreed to be videoed brought a pineapple with him, and that was, that was the start. You can't make that up. <laughs> <laughs> Nor should you. <laughs> Nor should you. Let me ask you this. Are there questions you find yourself exploring over and over again or returning to as you write? Yeah, I think in some sense you could argue that most poets are, are writing a version of the same poem for their, their entire lives. Um, I think that actually our most successful poems are the ones where we allow ourselves to really just sort of go over the a bend with our obsessive natures. And I certainly have an obsessive my, nature myself, but I'm also, quite frankly, obsessed with other obsessives. And that's often a starting point for me as well, reading about people who are just so passionate about one thing. You're also the co-editor of two journals, the Delaware Poetry Review and Beltway Poetry Quarterly, which you founded. Right. Right. I Yes, I actually co-founded one and, and founded the other on my own. Both of them are online literary journals, and they really exist to help promote poets from the Mid-Atlantic region and to try and, and find a larger readership for these poets. And so having uh, them online is a really important tool. You can just reach so many more people. Beltway Poetry Quarterly came first, and then about, I don't know, half a dozen years later, you started the Delaware Poetry Review. Why? What was the need for the second, the second journal? There was a, a group of people who were already editing other journals who came together to uh, co-create the Delaware Poetry Review. And that was simply because of all the mid-Atlantic states, Delaware had the fewest literary journals. It was the least well-served of the area. So in every issue, we include some writers from Delaware. The idea was to provide another venue. And you're also a literary historian. I am, yeah. I've really focused on writers who have had strong ties to Washington, D.C., and I have a book coming out next year, spring of 2018, from the University of Virginia Press, and it's called A Literary History of Washington, D.C., from Francis Scott Key to Zora Neale Hurston. So what I'm doing there is I'm looking at the history of Washington, D.C. from its founding up to just the beginnings of modernism, so that earlier history, which is is not as well known. And the book includes portraits and excerpts, but it also includes four walking tours. And I've been leading these literary walking tours for, oh, a couple of decades now. So there's one, Walt Whitman and the Civil War, I also do the Dunbars, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and his wife, uh, Alice Moore Dunbar Nelson, and that's the Reconstruction period, Henry Adams during the Gilded Age, and then Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, and others who are active in D.C. during what's now become known as the Harlem Renaissance. So looking at major sort of groups of writers around different time periods, but all in in D.C. Which takes us so neatly to the third section of your book of poetry. Why don't you read Double Indemnity? 
Okay, so I mention an archive in here at the uh, University of Maryland. It's a, an archive of Maryland writers. Double indemnity. No, not insurance. What I meant to say was double identity, as in Boutros Boutros Ghali, William Carlos Williams, Sirhan Sirhan, Lady Gaga. For these folks, surely the postman always rings twice. But now I've Mildred pierced myself to the image of James M. Kane typing away in his little white house in suburban Maryland. His typewriter is preserved in a university library. I've seen it. I've seen the change from manual to electric to electronic to what the hell is a typewriter, and no one will be archiving our battered, beloved iPads, even if they once belonged to Yo-Yo Ma, Flava Flav, or Marky Mark. Now all our devices must do at least two things. Phone cameras, calculator umbrellas, but in truth, all of us lead double lives. An outer story plus a hidden story, separated by such a thin skin. Tell us that one again. Ford Maddox Ford, Chris Christofferson, Humbert Humbert, Richie Rich. Double Indemnity. Kim Roberts. I like your sense of humor in that poem. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I can't help myself with the uh, the puns. When you think of yourself as an artist, as a poet, what do you feel pretty confident about claiming? Hmm. And no one will think you're arrogant. Uh, I guess curiosity uh, and engagement with things outside of myself. You know, I, I think there are Parts of myself that get revealed nonetheless because it's me writing about these subjects. But usually uh, my goal is not to be confessional, but to explore something that piques my curiosity, something that I can learn something new from. What do you work on being better at? Oh, well, you can never learn enough about craft. I, I feel like I'm constantly trying to get the the content of the poems, what I'm saying, to either match up with or work against the song elements of the poem. So what it says and how it says it have to be related, uh, be sparking against each other. Otherwise, I'd be writing prose, I guess. Um, I'd be writing nonfiction. What poetry does and does so well is those, those song elements. And if the language is not exciting, the poem is not working. I guess, uh, again, I'm, I'm showing my hand here. It's, it's not really plot that is the most interesting. It's, it's how it's said. Kim Roberts, thank you. Thank you for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I so enjoy your work. I think the poems are very idiosyncratic. And I feel like I'm taking a walk with you and you're taking me down these alleyways and byways that I wouldn't wander into on my own. And you're pointing everything out that I might have missed, that I'm sure I would have missed. So it makes sense to me why you do walking tours around D.C. because you do textural tours with your poetry, then I really appreciate oh, it. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. That's Kim Roberts. Her book is called The Scientific Method. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.